So. Actually, the sixth annual section of the China Globalization, China Global Think Tank, Innovation Think Tank. So, welcome to all of you. And I'm Henry Hui Yao Wang, founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. Thank you for tuning in this uh, special opening dialogue of our sixth annual China Global Think Tank Innovation Forum 2021, live from uh, CCG head office here in Beijing, we're in our conference uh, uh, room. Uh, today, we are very honored, actually very pleased to have an, an old friend, also Dr. John Hammer. He's the president uh, of one of the most prominent think tanks in the US, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where short name the CSIS. So he's uh, uh, taking out his uh, time in the evening here with us. So we're going to explore the uh, topics that are centered about think tanks, about American foreign policy, about uh, pandemic changes, about uh, think tank innovation, which is uh, our conference today, but also about uh, uh, area we can collaborate. I would like to briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. John Hammer. Um, he's the president and CEO and a Langong chair in American leadership at CSIS. Before joining CSI, he served as the 26th uh, U.S. Uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense and uh, held uh, senior positions in the U.S. Senate Armed Service Committee and in the Congressional Budget Office. He has numerous uh, uh, involvement uh, in his uh, previous career. And he received his uh, PhD with distinction from SAS uh, of the John Hopkins University in 1978. So, so <laughs> welcome, uh, John, and uh, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang, and congratulations to you and the Center for China and Globalization. My goodness, what a wonderful job you've done in building this institution. It's very impressive. Thank you. Actually, we, we are today, you know, we are having uh, uh, this uh, sixth uh, annual Global Think Tank Innovation Summit. So we have very uh, privileged to invite you as the opening uh, speaker. And uh, we're gonna have followed by a, a next panel. We're gonna have a, a, a five think tanks uh, from US and China to talk about further. But to this, for this one, you know, we are, we are actually entering a very interesting time. And uh, as uh, uh, during our pre, uh, uh, this uh, start of the discussion, we know that the world has, has changed uh, uh, fundamentally, we are, we are facing pandemic and we are, we're having a lot of uh, challenges and, uh, and uh, the, the, the world is really at a crossroad. And uh, so uh, given your, uh, your experience uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a leading the think tank of uh, uh, you know, one of the leading think tanks in the world. Uh, so, so we would like to open in uh, with you on the, on the think tank topic. Uh, as we know, you see, is a uh, is a think tank that was founded in 1962, which is uh, almost uh, 50, 60 years ago. And uh, and you've been at home, you, you've been <laughs> running that think tank for 20 years. Uh, make that into uh, you know when 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 you when you come to that think tank, the think tank still have a deficit. Now you make that into one of the most influential think tank uh, in the in the world. So so what what what's your experience in in your share with us? How, your your how, how you uh, have built up this think tank and what is your experience uh, uh, and uh, what is the, uh, 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 your, your uh, uh, recommendation you know, you know, for our think tank community because we are having a think tank conference today. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, Dr. Wang, I, um, boy, I, I made so many mistakes uh, when I came to CSS and you're right, we were 
we were in very deep trouble when I first came to CSIS, uh, but we were able to get out of it. I think the, our, in one sense, our poverty was helpful because we were so poor back then. We, and we had to raise 97% of our budget every year. So it made, I had to listen carefully to what the market wanted. I, I, I didn't have the luxury of just doing my own thing. We had to listen to what were the problems people were experiencing and how could we make a contribution. Uh, and then the key to success is the quality of your staff. Uh, it, it, I inherited a staff that wasn't very strong to be honest. Uh, and th the entire journey of my 21 years has been to hire really good people. And so that's, uh, you know, hire good people, give them a lot of flexibility uh, and, and uh, establish the culture so that people feel that they have to do honest and objective work. That's really great. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> talent is always, almost, uh, always important. Uh, so, so I'd like to actually, uh, 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 you know, come to the recent uh, CSIS re released uh, a report. Uh, it's called Advancing U.S.-China Healthy Security Cooperation in an Area of a Strategic uh, Competition, uh, which revolved around the area of U.S.-China can work together, uh, for example, on the health, uh, including vaccine, travel, public health infrastructure, uh, biosafety supply chain, and countering disinformation. And uh, so, as you know, that uh, think tank uh, these days, you know, can play a very active role in terms of making all those recommendations. So what do you think now? Uh, with, uh, we are facing this uh, uh, once in a century, probably, uh, catastrophe of this uh, pandemic. Uh, where did you see where we can get out of that and how we can really work together? I mean, internationally at, uh, uh, you know, multilateral level, and of course, also China, U.S. as two largest uh, uh, leading country uh, in the economy in the world. How we can work together and things like that. Yeah, these are. This is a very large and important question. Um, you know, there's a central paradox that we've experienced these last two years. Um, you know, it's very clear with something like a pandemic that no one country can act on its own and protect itself. I mean, there has to be international cooperation to deal with something like a global pandemic. But people that lead countries naturally respond to the pressure within their own country. And so there's a parochialism that gets, that becomes very strong in a period like this. Every, every country in the world basically tried to find solutions for themselves uh, to deal with a pandemic. Uh, and it highlighted that international health organizations are not strong organizations. So I, I do think there is some very fundamental thinking that we need to do because we're not, China isn't going to give up its capacity to, to decide its own path for health, public health. We're going to hold on to that ourselves, but we do have to find ways where we can cooperate. I think the bright spot over the last two years uh, was with the medical research community that where there were international networks that, that uh, communicated with each other and, and joined together in, in a shared effort. In the private sector, international cooperation was very impressive. The, you know, in the public sector, governments, the cooperation wasn't so good, you know, but in the private sector, it was very good. And so I think it's a bit of a, an idea about what we could do in a broader sense so we could work together. How do we help our respective civil societies to work more closely on medical preparedness? I think that's a real opportunity. Now on specifically on China, look, we've got, we, we, you know, we're, I, I'm unhappy about the direction we're in right now. There's a lot of tension between our two countries. They, we, you know, it's, I, I don't, 
we have to find ways where we can work on shared problems. And certainly public health, global public health is a shared problem. So I think there's an opportunity here. Yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, John. Actually, uh, uh, I, I know that uh, both US and China are really favored that uh, patent wavering, uh, you know, for, for developing countries in terms of producing the vaccine. And, uh, you know, hopefully at the coming up at WTO ministerial meetings, you know, WTO, US and China can reach something on these uh, new efforts in terms of uh, supporting developing countries and getting vaccine. So, uh, you know, un unless everyone is safe, we're finally safe. You know, we got to make a, uh, make a, make a, a lot of uh, lead on that. Uh, uh, you're right, you know, China and the US can uh, work uh, many ways and uh, uh, on that. And, and you, you also mentioned about US-China uh, cooperation and, and also you're not satisfied with the, with the, with the current situation. Uh, 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 that uh, you think there's, there's uh, you know, uh, ways to collaborate. And uh, so we're glad to see that, uh, uh, you know, China and the U.S. has actually made a joint statement that uh, uh, COP26 on climate change. You know, so, so that is another big area, you know, we can collaborate. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, pandemic could come again, or, you know, even yeah. we are contained, you know. So what do you think about the, you know, climate change and the things that we can also work together in terms of the common, the common background? Well, I, I, I do think it is an area that we can work together. I'm, in, you know, I'm, I'm impressed by a lot of the, the forward-looking policies that China has, for example, on electric vehicles. I mean, it's, it's impressive what China is proposing to do for itself. Um, you know, obviously, you are a country in transition, energy transition. We are, too but you're in a country with energy transition. And so I think there are opportunities that we could explore. Uh, where can we collaborate on mm -hmm. climate change? Um, you know, I mean, it, we do have to find a number of things where we can at least have conversations with each other, look at joint, potentially joint projects, just like in the healthcare area. I mean, there was actually a fairly robust collaboration between our medical scientists, you know, for many years, which was a good thing because it became the foundation point for the cooperation that did exist for, for the pandemic. So we should look for these opportunities, Dr. Wong. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you Dr. Uh, you know, John Hammer, yeah, Henry. So, so what, what, uh, what uh, 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 I think that uh, really make the, uh, you know, the two countries uh, uh, interesting now is that the world has a lot of, uh, uh, common demand, actually, you know, the, for example, the, the infrastructure, we, we see that uh, worldwide, there is a, there is a huge uh, 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 demand for infrastructure, developing countries, but also developed countries. I noticed that uh, European uh, leader just announced uh, last week, they're going to uh, come up with 350 billion euro uh, on, uh, uh, you know, putting the uh, euro, euro <laughs> Your gateway, you know, EU gateway uh, project for infrastructure. President uh, uh, Biden mentioned about, uh, you know, past uh, his 1.2 trillion uh, uh, infrastructure bill. And on the same day, he talked to President Xi uh, 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 after he signed that bill. And uh, of course, China has this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which has been carrying on for the last eight years. So, so infrastructure wise, I mean, we had the World Bank, we had the uh, uh, BRICS, New Development Bank, uh, we had the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, on this, uh, and also G7 proposed the Build Back Better, uh, D3W by President Biden. So do you think that we can really, you know, work together on those uh, uh, infrastructure where I think we have the biggest de denominator, biggest uh, draw of, uh, of the future benefits for everyone, and then that's where probably can sustain us for the next uh, half a century uh, of, of uh, prosperity and success and, and, uh, and gross uh, potential. So what do you think about that? You know, all those areas that we could uh, work on infrastructure. Yeah, you know, there's, a, there's an astounding demand around the world for infrastructure building. 
uh, in some places for brand new infrastructure, in some places like in the United States for modernizing our infrastructure. It's, uh, you know, I will, I'll be honest, it's rather embarrassing to look at the state of a lot of America's bridges and roads. Our airports are not, they're, they're d disappointing. So there's a lot that we should do, but globally infrastructure is a major issue. And I think what we should probably do is, you know, start by looking at what are the areas where we know that there is a trend we're all going to want to deal with, such as uh, how, do, how do we build sustainable infrastructure, infrastructure that has a revenue base underneath it. So it doesn't become a white elephant, you know, it doesn't become a, uh, you know, a very giant project that, that can't support itself financially. So I think there's some financial things. I think we need to find ways to help uh, third, country, third world countries to do a better job of managing complex uh, tender offerings. Uh, this is a complicated thing. Infrastructure projects are big and elaborate and complex. Helping other countries do a better job of deciding what's in their interest, what is sustainable. Those I think would be things we could work on together. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, uh, so John, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we're we also, the, uh, the theme of our topic today is also American uh, foreign policy and mm. uh, uh, we, we know that, uh, I know it's very significant that, uh, uh, that uh, President Biden actually, when he said uh, during the uh, Afghanistan withdrawal, uh, he, he said, uh, from now on, the U.S. will no, no longer seek nation building. And uh, which I think it's a, it's a very serious reflection of what has been happening in the last two decades in Afghanistan, maybe to that matter to other countries. So what do you think on, on that U.S. foreign policy front, uh, there's some is there some deep thinking and uh, a reflection going on, and particularly President Biden saying that? Uh, uh, is, is, there, uh, is there a paradigm shift or something like that? Well, you know, it, I think President Biden was reflecting um, what the American public feels, which is we were in Afghanistan, we didn't have a strategy, we were not successful. And we shouldn't get involved in things where we don't know what we're doing. Uh, I think that's a basic, I think that was basically the commentary uh, of, that was behind that statement. Now, does it mean that America is going to pull back uh, from working with other countries in the world towards, you know, building stronger institutions, uh, et cetera. No, I don't think it means that we'll abandon that, but I do think it means that Americans uh, feel, uh, certainly the Biden administration feels this, but I think most Americans do that uh, we used the military to excessively and we didn't really have a plan and we were not successful. And so it's, I think, a foreign policy that is more focused on uh, solid economics, on social development, and on traditional diplomacy is, I think, what he's talking about. The term nation building it took on a quality of an American, you know, kind of a, we were going to shape the world so it looked like us. And I think that is over. I don't think we're doing that any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. And uh, I also noticed actually uh, uh, President Biden uh, said uh, during the President Xi and the President Biden virtual summit, uh, just uh, recently, he basically, President Biden said, uh, okay, the U.S. Uh, does not seeking to change China and does not also wants to have alliance against China. So uh, uh, he also uh, recognized one ch uh, China policy. So he showed some, uh, you know, uh, positive yeah. uh, attitudes there. So, so, but we are actually seeing, you know, probably U.S. is divided. You know, you have a very hawkish Congress. You have, a, uh, you know, other other uh, uh, stakeholders. So, what do you think about, the, you know, can we really, you know, China U.S. <laughs> relation? If if China, you know, uh, on its own, I mean, uh, can become the second largest economy, there must be something done right. And uh, so, how can we really peacefully? coexisting, as President Xi put it in, in the statement when he met uh, uh, virtually with President Biden. So what do you think about, uh, in general assessment, uh, that uh, what we can do about the Sino-U.S. relations? Yeah, uh, you know, it, the, the 
sentiments in Washington are very negative right now about China. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, I think, very unfortunate because it makes us hard, it makes it hard for us to develop, you know, real ideas, real policies uh, in a constructive way. Um, look, we're, we're two great countries. We're, we have global interests. We're going to have areas where we're going to disagree with each other. We're going to rub up against each other, you know, in ways. So we know because we've got these complex multidimensional interests and they're not always aligned. They're not, they're sometimes their intention. Um, we have to find ways where we don't let the tension overwhelm us and prevent us from having the kind of constructive conversation to work through the problems. Now, in, in the US, I think, I, I think in Washington, I'll say in Washington, there are basically two camps. And one camp believes that China is racing ahead, it's going to be dangerous, we better stop them any way we can. That's one camp. The second camp, and I'm in the second camp, the second camp is, this is a huge unprecedented competition we're out of shape. It's like a runner that hasn't been exercising. Well, we're out of shape. We're going to have to get in shape if we're going to stay up in this competition. Uh, so instead of trying to trip China because it's running ahead of us, we need to work harder to run faster. So I, I, I think I'm in the second camp. I believe that, um, that America's focus ought to be on improving ourselves fixing our own problems, overcoming the problems within our own society. This is where I think we should be focusing rather than, sh than having the conversation with China being about opposition to everything you say or do. You know, that's going to go nowhere in my view. So I'm in the camp that says if America is going to compete effectively, we've got to get stronger internally. Yeah, that's that's a, a great comment. I think that that is really more realistic and uh, a rational approach. Uh, so, so thank you for for your comment. And uh, uh, we know that uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, is uh, uh, coming up with a midterm election next year. And uh, 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 so, how do you how do you assess the the uh, the, the U.S. Uh, the political landscape? I mean, uh, we have uh, you know. Uh, Democrats barely have a majority at the, at the Senate House, and uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know the the we, we see the, the the gap, you know, the top elite and and then the massive population in the U.S. The gap is uh, is still still widening. I mean, uh, in terms of the middle class, haven't seen their real income uh, uh, gone up in the last mm -hmm. uh, you know 20, 30 years, and whereas uh, China now, I mean, they 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 preempting that, you know, they. They have been starting to, you know, common prosperity and lift 800 million people out of poverty, so prevent the populism, this kind of drive. So, uh, I, I think that uh, you know, uh, with uh, with Trump, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, even though he's not in office, but Trumpism is still very <laughs> thrive, uh, thriving. And uh, so, how do you assess the political, uh, uh, you know, future of of next two years? Where it's very important if. Uh, if uh, the U.S., uh, you know, direction the U.S. is taking, it's affecting the world. It's affecting U.S.-China relations. And you, you, you are the top expert on U.S. think tank. So probably this is your area. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it, I, I'm hardly an expert, but I think about this uh, all the time. Um, you know, uh, America has had two periods in its history where there were profound changes in our political system. Uh, one was about 1842, basically to 1860. Um, and of course that, that it, it ended in a civil war, which was a bad thing. Uh, the other big period of change, lots of tension, politics got turned upside down was from about 1885 until 1915. Um, it, in both cases, they, it lasted over 20 years. And I, I'm, I'm afraid we're in the front end of a, probably a 20 year period 
where our politics is going through profound restructuring. Um, and I, I, you know, I have my, my own personal views uh, about it. I don't think either party, political party here, is effectively focusing on the challenges we're going to face over the next 10 years or 15 years. I think both, both of the parties are battling over the, you know, the, their policies of the past rather than looking forward to the future. So I think we're going to be internally divided. I think there will be, there's still going to be a lot of progressive work, but it's going to happen more at the state level. And I think the economic disparity that you mentioned is very real and is going to be the greatest thing we're going to have to work on. And I would say that's, that's the big debate that we have right now uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, but I don't know that what's going to come out of it is going to be a, a breakthrough. Uh, I think we're going to have, I think we're going to have internal tension in the United States probably for the next 15 years. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I, I noticed that uh, you, you, uh, in your previous uh, uh, discussion or statement that you mentioned about, uh, you think that the CPTPP is a, is a TPP is a good idea and uh, uh, maybe U.S. should be back on that. And actually, now we're, we're having the WTO kind of a marginalized and uh, paralyzed, if not uh, use that word. And then we see the uh, uh, RCEP is being uh, effected uh, uh, the January 1st uh, next year. CPTPP is one of the most uh, advanced uh, uh, trade uh, uh, you know, agreement, free trade agreement among initially uh, designed by the US largely and, uh, and now US is back out of that. But China actually showed a great interest. China actually, uh, mm -hmm. Premier Li and uh, President Xi, all expressed strong interest to uh, to to join the CPTPP, and uh, and actually UK is applying that. Uh, South Korea may apply that. Uh, so do you think probably if uh, if uh, also maybe US is coming back someday? So we, you know we have a new platform to talk about the 21st century trade issues, and we. Because WTO cannot solve things because it's get so you know clumsy and one is 64 members, whereas TPP have 12, 13, 14 members. We can really work on something on that and solve those uh, difficult issues, and then we may, may lead the world for a, a guaranteed trade prosperity, investment prosperity. So, what do you think about this, uh, you know, CPTPP that uh, we we you know what it can bring and what can be working together? Well, I I, I thought it was a, a major mistake on the part of President Trump to pull out of the TPP. And I'm glad that Japan moved forward to work on the CPTPP. I, 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 that acronym always, I struggle with it, but I thought that was a very good thing that they did that. Um, I, I wish that the Biden administration would see the opportunity uh, to join CPTPP, but I don't know that they're going to. Uh, and that's a, that's a mistake in my view. I mean, in my view, we should be leaning forward. Every country has to find ways to get higher productivity in their economies in order to pay for the different things we have to do. You have an aging society. We have an aging society. We've got uh, a widened gap in in economic opportunity in America. Uh, the, the best way, one of the few really good ways to deal with that is to expand and open up wider on trade opportunities. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that the Biden administration is going to see, see it that way, unfortunately. Uh, but I do think, and I, and I also think that there is a larger uh, restructuring underway now. Um, we're starting to see, and we're, it, was, it started before uh, the COVID pandemic, but we're starting to see a, instead of globalization, we're starting to see regionalization of trade patterns. And of course, that was a very large push of the Trump administration to bring manufacturing back to the United States. Uh, I do think that there is a big re re sorting out that's going on now. My personal 
concern is that I, I'm worried because of the tension between China and the United States and the policies that we're taking. We could be unfortunately dividing the global economy into two spheres. And I don't know that that's going to be good for anybody. I mean, uh, you know, it, it isn't going to be a catastrophe, but I don't think it's the best interests of everyone. And uh, the, the, the trend we're on right now is very much towards bifurcating the international economic order. And I think the trade issue fits into that, Henry. So I, mm -hmm. I, I think there needs to be a larger conversation about where is the global economy going? Uh, you know, what trends are underway? Uh, do we, do, can we manage the trends? that are emerging. I, there's some big issues here. And of course, you know, with the Center for China and Globalization, this is a pretty big deal for you. So it's a conversation we should probably have together at some point. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, John. And uh, so w actually, uh, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that uh, uh, USTR, Kathleen Chai uh, spoke at just uh, CSI is just not too long ago. And she actually said recoupling, you know, <laughs> and this, you yeah. know, so, <laughs> right. I mean, you know, I think that uh, she's talking to Vice Premier Liu He and China counterpart, and uh, and I, you know, yeah, trade is probably the biggest, uh, uh, con, con, uh, you know, connectivity between our two countries, and a U.S. Yeah. company is still doing a lot of business in China, like uh, like a Universal Studio they just opened in Beijing. It's the largest in the world, and it's only only open a third of it is already the largest in the world. We have a million people flooded there. Uh, I can't get a ticket to, to, to see the Universal Studio in Beijing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the potential for U.S. business is enormous, and uh, we we can't see how we can Tesla is doing fabulous here, you know, and uh, and Boeing and uh, you know Qualcomm and many other U.S. companies. So, so you're right. I mean this uh, this. Uh, uh, you know, business uh, uh, that we have a bipolar world, we have a bi, you know, uh, uh, two sphere of, of uh, system that is going to be really destrumental, to, destructive to the world. So, so uh, I, I agree that uh, we, we really need to work together. And uh, so, so finally, uh, you know, uh, we, we had about, uh, you know, we already have about 10,000 people watch online. We have, uh, we have 100 people, a conference from all think tank community. Uh, we're going to have a lot of things going on uh, this this whole day. Uh, uh, so, John, you you really kind to to be our, our uh, first speaker. And uh, what what you know, since is, uh, today is a think tank innovation <laughs> conference uh, uh, summit. So we we like to ha come back again on some think tank question because you know, like the U.S., you have a revolving door, you have a, a nonpartisan stand, you have. A, you know, how this uh, uh, running a U.S. think tank. I know you moved to a new building a few years back. I, when I first went to CSI, it was actually on a uh, very small office. Now you have a huge building now. So how, how do you, you know, think tank advice? You know, how, how does the U.S. think tank and what, 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 what can, you know, be shared with Chinese uh, colleagues uh, uh, during our think tank uh, today conference? Well, well, Henry, I would, look, I... Uh, you know, I can only speak about America. You know, I don't, I don't know other countries well enough sure, sure. to really talk about their systems. But I know in America, we're in a period where our two political parties are so busy just fighting each other over, over small matters that they don't have time to think about big ideas. So that's what think tanks are now doing. That's what we're now trying to do. We're trying to do strategic thinking for America. Uh, and I think that's a role that think tanks in general should be embracing. We have to develop ideas and test them out, explore them. How would they work? Where would they, where would they not work? I mean, we have to do all of that because right now our governments are struggling to find ways to work with each other. And I think it's very important. I think uh, in, in, in my 21 years at CSIS, I feel like we're just starting. To, to pick up our real program. Uh, because I think the future, is, we're going to need people like CSIS and other think tanks, we're going, to, we're going to have a much bigger role to play 
over the next 20 years. So, and I think that's probably the case around the world. I mean, governments struggle to, to deal with new ideas. New ideas come in and usually big bureaucracies take old ideas and make them more complicated. They don't, they don't invent new ideas. So think tanks have to do that. And that's where we have to have good constructive relations with our own government, but then also open conversations with friends in other countries. That's, that's great. And uh, so John, I mean, uh, we, we, uh, I personally visited CSIS many times and participated uh, quite a few activities, even one debate at one time. Uh, and also, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I know that uh, we, we had an event this year uh, with a Singapore uh, think tank, CSI, mm -hmm. CCG together. Uh, you spoke there as well. So, so what do you think about the, the track two, you know, the 1.5 track that uh, think tank dialogues, particularly US and China can, you know, bring the uh, relationship uh, into more understanding, into more, uh, 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 you know, uh, communic better communication. As you said, the government probably too busy. We, we can uh, provide a lot of uh, ideas and, uh, and in those dialogues. So, so what do you think about that? And particularly during this difficult time and also plus the pandemic, we need a more think tank dialogue, yeah. like we yeah, have today. I, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think, I think over the next 10 years, track one and a half, track two dialogues are going to be more important than any time in our history. Uh, it's hard for the governments to meet each other because the politicians are so busy throwing rocks at the other side, okay? We can at least meet and talk to each other as as professionals and as friends. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree, but it means we can have an honest conversation with each other. And I think it's very hard for that to happen now in government circles. So we, are, we have a very important mission, I think over the next, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I mean, it, it's going to be more important than ever that we explore in conversations like we're having now. Uh, okay, where do we disagree? And why do we disagree? And what can we do about it? There have to be some parts where we have common interests, even though we don't talk about it to each other. What are those? What are those things? And then we can, then we're going to be in a better position when we have real hard issues that we have to share with each other. You know, because we're going to have that. We're big countries. I mean, that's just that's unavoidable. But we do have to have a framework where we can talk to each other. And I think that's what track one and a half is going to be, especially over the next 10, 15 years. Yes, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John Hamry. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Hamry. Actually, you, you, are, you are really sharing a very valuable insights uh, uh, this morning and this evening. And uh, you know, we, we talked uh, quite a few things about how U.S.-China can collaborate. We talk about uh, uh, climate change, fighting pandemic, infrastructure, U.S. foreign policy, uh, and, and also uh, U.S. internal politics. And of course, China, U.S. Uh, cooperation and the importance of think tank in a contemporary uh, 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 world as well. So, so really, uh, it's a fascinating opening <laughs> panel for opening uh, section for our think tank uh, conference today. So. So on behalf of the uh, Center for China Globalization, I want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. John Hamry, uh, uh, president of uh, CSIS, one of the most influential think tank in the US. So I appreciate your, 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 your comment, your, your last word, and uh, we, we, we say goodbye to you. Well, I, uh, let me say again how much I admire what you've done, Dr. Wang, at, uh, at the Center for China and Globalization. I'm very impressed by the scholars you have, the professionalism of your programs. Uh, I'm sorry these last two years we've been, we've not been able to meet, you know, but we can do it this way. And, uh, and as I said, I, I do feel we're in a period of time where we're going to have to be honest with each other about where we disagree, but we have to have a framework where we're talking to each other, where we can understand each other. And uh, I think you will play a crucial role in that. And I hope that we can continue to work together. Thank you so much, uh, John. And thank you for your <laughs> fabulous uh, discussion. I, thank you. I, I okay. appreciate being invited. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye now.